Welcome Representative Ralph Samuels to the podium and let him educate us. Thanks, Chuck. And before I start, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues for taking time. Craig Johnson and uh, Peggy Wilson from Randall and Kyle Johansson from Ketchikan. And more than all of those, actually, being in the legislature is a relatively thankless job. And it, particularly now, actually, more than any other time. But uh, Mary Nelson has served in the legislature for 10 years now from Bethel, and she is not going to be running for office again. So 10 years of her life, she is now going to move on into the private sector. And I can't tell you, Mary's become one of my very best friends in the legislature, and I'll be friends with her after her and I are long gone from public office. So I just want to take this time to thank you publicly for the 10 years of your life. She gave to you. So, um, as I said in Southeast Conference, I started, the, started this presentation, the Southeast Conference, it's not a happy speech. It is very realistic, and quite frankly, there might be some people that disagree, but nothing that I say here today is going to be controversial. The people at ICER, the economists you talk about, they say these are just the facts of the world. This is the way the Alaskan economy works. We're not talking about state government. How state government is funded, I try to stay away from that, but the economy as a whole, how the money flows into your pocket and into all the businesses, that's what I'm trying to get across here. We're not going to talk about, you know, we're all arguing about oil tax legislation up the hill. It has nothing to do with particular tax rates or this or that curves and everything else. What we're trying to, to educate Alaskans on is how the money gets from A to B and it flows through the economy into nonprofits, into restaurants, into little airlines into cruise ships, how it all works together. So that's what I'm trying to get across today. And if I stray from that, I'm sure that some people are going to remind me of it. So at the end of it, I hope you remember how the economy works. And mostly on this last one, what you can do to influence it. As an individual, I learned the legislative process by walking the halls up there as a private citizen. And I'm telling you, there's nothing more frustrating in the world than to try to figure out what's going on in that building up the hill right now. I didn't represent anybody but myself and my family, and it was the most frustrating thing in the world. How do you influence public policy? And I learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes. I would get told walking down the hallway, well, Ralph, you have to go talk to that guy. And I go, well, I don't really like that guy. He says, that doesn't matter. He's the chairman, or he, he controlled this group, or he's in charge of the Bush people, or the Anchorage people, or the Fairbanks guys. You have to go talk to that guy. And it is a frustrating thing to learn. And what I'd like to try to do here is how you can influence it. Whether you agree or disagree with me on any given issue or position, politicians do what our constituents tell us to do. If we do not, the community will find somebody else to represent them. It's simple as that. And there's a fine line between trying to show leadership when I know way more than my constituents do on a, any given subject, and I try to explain to them how things work and why I saw the world the way I did, there's a fine line between doing that and if you have an overwhelming support for something that your constituents want you to do. And you, as a politician, you're always trying to balance this out, trying to show some leadership and trying to make sure that you still don't lose contact with your constituents. And sometimes it's a very difficult balance to walk as, as one out of 60 legislators in particular. The executive branch is a little bit different subject, but as a legislator, everything hits to the middle, nobody wins, nobody's ever happy. That's the, kind of the reality. Okay, so the economy of Alaska right now. In 1979, we had an income tax. We didn't have a lot of oil money. Had a gross receipts tax, we had a school tax. Today, no income tax. No statewide sales tax. I got a check for $1,654, which the visa company really appreciated because they actually got paid. School tax, not existent today. And this is the slide that should really tell everything. And I want to give this presentation, what I feel like doing is having everybody stare at that slide and just stop and talk at your table on what you think the future of Alaska looks like. A third of our economy, the jobs and the money flowing through our economy in Alaska, starts at the federal government. And we're going to talk a lot about more about how that flows, where it comes from, why, why Alaska is a higher per capita. It's not all the reason that you would think. 
Next is oil and gas. It's another third. That includes the money that comes out of the ground. It's our royalty. It gets shuffled up the building up the hill. We distribute it amongst all, the, all of the uh, citizens. It still started with oil and gas. That includes all the jobs, the investments that are made on the North Slope, in Cook Inlet, sometimes around Fairbanks. Oil and gas is a third of the economy. No matter how it gets sifted through and how it gets spent, a third of our economy is the federal government, and a third of our economy is the oil and gas industry. Or the oil and gas, I shouldn't say the industry. No back. Sorry. Everything else, all tourism, all fishing, all mining, all timber combined don't equal what one third, either the federal government has an impact or the oil and gas industry has an impact. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why. And particularly here in Southeast, when you talk about in Southeast Alaska, you don't have any oil field service companies anywhere probably southeast of Anchorage. There's not in Yakutat, there's not in Cordoba, there's not in Valdez, well, that's, that's not true. In Valdez, the deep. But none down here. So a lot of times when I talk to people in Southeast, they're like, no, eh, you know, it doesn't really affect me. And here's the reality once again. The political climate affects you. Your day-to-day -day life, right now as I look around the room here, I've got Craig Johnson, represents 16,000 people. He's in the district next to mine in South Anchorage. I've got another 16,000. Mary has 16,000 in Western Alaska. We've got 48,000 people represented here amongst the three of us. 48,000 Alaskans that have never set foot on a ferry, ever. So if our economy declines, and it comes time to cut the budget because now you're gonna come and tax my 16,000 and her 16,000 and his 16,000 people, income taxes, spend the permanent fund earnings, gonna be a sales tax. When it comes time, what's gonna be easier for us to do? Cut the budget or take money out of the pockets of an individual citizen? Cut the budget. I, mean, I can guarantee you that right now. You can look at when Knowles was governor, when Governor Knowles was here, it was easier to cut the budget and go get money from somewhere. So why should you care how the economy of the state goes? You know, fishing and tourism and government pretty much run as you know. You get down to catch a camp, fishing and tourism, some timber. That's why you should care because as the economy of the state goes, we are all in the same boat. Have no illusions about it. You look at the way that the politics right now Anchorage, Matsu, Kenai, Fairbanks. We've got a lot of different interests than we do down there. We need to make sure that as we set public policy as individual Alaskans, that we think of us as one entire state. Because if we start to divide and conquer, sometimes the politics plays out. That is, is the way that it will have to work if we want to continue with a strong economy for this state. I haven't started my presentation yet, I'm on my soapbox, but I believe this with all my heart. If we start to divide and conquer, when I came to Juneau, what the press likes to pay up is a lot of conflicts between Republicans and Democrats. That's usually what you read about, the minority and the majority and this and that. What I have found is more geographical than party lines. The philosophical things that make the news, they tend to be, they tend to be real the sexy palace intrigue type things. But the reality is, when the votes come, it's geographical. Everybody votes for their 16,000 constituents in the House, or their 32,000 constituents in the Senate. And if we don't start looking, all of us as legislators, looking long-term and statewide, we are going to have problems. And now I'll get off the soapbox and start talking about the economy then. 